Yeah, let's go. Okay, so I am the last talk before the keynote. Um, so I am uh, very grateful that you've stuck around for the two days. Um, it's super hot outside, so really you're much better off in here, in the air conditioning anyway. So I'm going to talk to you guys about um, whether or not we're making our engineers blue. And I don't mean sad, um, although sometimes we do as security folk, we just can't help it. Um, I'm going to talk about blue teaming. Um, so defensive, um, I guess defensive tools and tactics and techniques for our software engineers, our developer teams, um, and our product teams. Um, I'm also going to talk about threat modeling. I just can't help it. I really love threat modeling. Uh, and that ends up being something that I just have to bring into everything I do. So we're going to start. So this all started because um, a leader of mine heard me talking about threat modeling in a previous company. And uh, he, yeah, he, um, he was like, this sounds really cool. I really like what you're doing. Um, but how about you create this minority report style screen and you can just pull in the threads? And uh, it reminded me of this Dilbert comic that I absolutely love, but it got something thinking. And what I want to do today is bring you on the journey of some of these tools that I've come across that I really enjoyed using for software engineers. And then I'm also going to introduce you a little bit to my journey about making a minority report style threat modeling screen, because it's, uh, it's a fun story. So. These are the things I'm going to cover. I'm going to talk about security champions, proof of concept, security tests, threat modeling, and elevation of privilege, and some cool stuff. This um, kind of makes me think about what it's like to be a developer nowadays, which is you started off as a software engineer, and you had your one job. And then all of a sudden, you've had to become full stack. So you previously, you just did your one thing. And now you're an infrastructure engineer. You're a DBA. You're, um, you've got to think about security and product. And it gets really challenging. Um, so these are some things that we're going to talk about today, but the main thing I want to just remind you of is to have empathy for our product teams. Their careers changed hugely. Their responsibilities have changed massively. As security folks, we've always had to be full stack, really. We've had to think about that full journey, but our engineers aren't so lucky. So we're going to start with just thinking about having some empathy for our product teams. So a lot of you will be familiar with something called Security Champions. Um, I like to call it Tash's Security Champions Ponzi Scheme or a pyramid scheme. I get in trouble for calling it that. But effectively, as, as individuals, we don't scale. So in security teams, not many of us are lucky enough to be in huge, great, big security teams. Uh, I went from financial services, where I was in a team of about 350 people for a US bank, and then I joined um, Photobox Group. I work for a guy called Dennis Cruz, which helped start a lot of the OWASP movement. And um, our security team is about 10 people. So we just don't scale with our software engineers. So what we do is I created this pyramid scheme <laughs> whereby the idea was I would start to talk to some of our software engineers and give them training and access to great tools, and then I would get them to pass on the message to their teams and so on. Um, I don't get them to pay me $10 each time. Uh, maybe I should, so I'd make a bit of money. But um, it's a great way for us to share what we're doing. But more importantly, it's given some of our software engineers a chance to have a real piece of ownership on what they're building. So we give them this training, and in response, we say, hey, you know what? You own the security for what you're building. That's your responsibility. I'm going to be here to support you and give you training and access to SMEs, so subject matter experts. But ultimately, you're the owner here. And we've used it as part of their career progression, too. So we've started to say that in your um, job description, in your um, job leveling guides, security champions are, are, are up here. And actually, it's become a thing where people want to become security champions. I've used this phrase before in previous companies, but sometimes our security champions are voluntold rather than volunteered. And um, what we've tried to do is really create this um, atmosphere of, hey, I really want to do that. I want to be a part of that group because I learn a lot and I get to progress my career, and it's really exciting. So security champions have been really powerful for us in helping us scale as a security team. So the next thing I want to talk about is proof of concepts. So proof of concepts for me have been a great way to um, I guess hammer the point home of why we should fix some things in a way that isn't too um, uh, frustratingly persistent. So what I've found with our security teams and our product owners, our software engineers get it, right? They kind of know that SQL injections are bad or public S3 buckets are bad. But I, uh, and then I don't know if you guys have had this too, but especially in Amazon, I've heard a lot of, yeah, but we use a really obscure URL for our objects, so it doesn't matter that it's public. Um, so I found this really cool completely legal until you use it tool um, called Greyhat Warfare. And effectively, what you can do is you can search objects. 
um, against S3, against the API, and it will pull back any um, items in S3 buckets that fit that object name. Uh, so credentials.csv is the name of the file when you download Amazon credentials, an API key and secret key. And uh, you wouldn't believe how many people immediately upload that back to Amazon into a public bucket or as a public object so that their application can access it. Uh, I got well over um, 4,000 results. Um, it was about 4,000 buckets with 11,000 objects. And many of them were valid credentials, um, which was really interesting to me. So what I started to do is when we meet with our security champions and we're talking about, hey, these are some, some attacks that we see in the wild, I'm starting to make it a bit more real for them. So I'm actually doing the demos in the session. They take like 10, 15 minutes, but it's way more powerful than saying, stop making your objects public. And I'm like, hey, look how easy it is for me to find these credentials out there. I don't even have to know your obscure bucket name anymore. I'm just looking for the word credentials. I've also been doing it for um, CloudFront subdomain takeovers. This is a particularly fun one. Um, AWS recently patched this. Um, I've pulled a screenshot from a guy called at Zephyrfish on Twitter, a guy called Andy from Scotland. Um, he does some great demos, but this one was um, where people weren't properly classifying their C names in their CloudFront distribution um, configuration, and you could effectively do a full subdomain takeover. Um, that was particularly fun, got some good bounty results on that one, but also really annoyed a couple of banks, so be super careful on how you use that one. But again, for me, the primary reason for doing these POCs is to make it truly real for our developers and also our product owners on how, truly, like, how easy it is to do these attacks. And it's not about shaming anyone. It's not about saying to the teams, look how bad this is. It's really about education and bringing them on the journey and making it um, way more accessible and, and uh, I suppose um, making it translatable. So for our product owners, especially when they're in these meetings and they're hearing about vulnerabilities and threats, can be quite confusing. So for me, this has been a great way to bring them on the journey. Right, so security tests. This is one of my favorite things to talk about other than threat modeling. Um, and this is a, an example from the um, Cloud Security OWASP project. And this is where we've been writing BDD tests to look for um, things that we found in the threat models. One of the challenges that we have is that often as security individuals, we'll, we'll talk to teams about findings or things they should fix. And then they'll tell us we fixed it. And we'll be like, that's great, thanks. But we don't continually test. And what we've started to look at is, when we find a threat, whether it's valid or not, is how do we write a test to continuously check every deployment or even against live environments to say, hey, is that still fixed? Is it still fixed? Is it still fixed? Because we found that often teams will roll out a deployment, roll out a fix, and then six months later, that vulnerability will be there again because they've either had to roll back or they've introduced new features. And as a security person, we figured, well, we've already talked to them about that. We found it and we fixed it, so why would we revisit it? Um, and it's something that's been incredibly frustrating for us. So I've looked at a couple of different ways of doing these. We've been doing some BDD tests and some TDD tests as well. Um, so an example of this is, um, uh, and, 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 and Tanya and Nancy, you, you spoke about using um, tools that look for secrets in your Git commits. Well, we had a lot of problems with that in one of my previous companies. So what we started to do is write um, local tests to absolutely validate they couldn't even get as far as committing, um, whether that was to their Git repo or putting it straight into an S3 bucket, because they did do that too. Um, and these were local tests that the engineers could run to just absolutely validate that there weren't any secrets in what they were trying to commit. So testing for us has been a really important way of validating what we're doing. I started to use this for compliance too, a bit of compliance as code. I know that my engineers don't read our security policies and why should they? Often they're not very well written and incredibly confusing. Um, so when it comes to PCI standards, it gets even harder. And in Europe, we have to deal with GDPR too, which is so confusing that even the lawmakers don't really understand it and tend to breach it most of the time too. So we've started to write tests to validate each of those sections in our compliance requirements. So now as a, a development team, hopefully you understand what we're asking you to do and we're bringing you on that journey and doing that training. But at the same time, when it comes to audit, we just push a pipeline. And then we get a validated load of tests that say, hey, you've passed, you've passed, you've passed, hopefully. Um, and it's allowing us to demonstrate compliance as code, which has been really useful. The other thing I've started to look at is something called test charters. This is from the development world rather than the security world. And, and for me, it shows a real power of us going to developer conferences. As I talked this morning about how we should speak more at development conferences and we should invite developers to speak more with security. Well, test charters is an example of something that I saw at development conference. So in a test charter, this is your test, super simple. What happens is you give it to your software engineers, your quality engineers, and you say, hey, I want you to go and explore this thing, this project, this feature, this story, whatever. I want you to use this tool, and I want you to look for these things. Now, you can be way more descriptive than this. 
But the idea is that it is an exploratory activity. So it's not necessarily an automated test, but it's an opportunity to take a learning exercise. Quality engineers often use this as spike stories to perform research, but we started to use it to help teach people around um, DAS, so dynamics uh, testing, um, even teach them a little bit about pen testing as well for those that are interested in it. So test charters have it really well for us. So I'm going to go on to threat modeling. This is my husband, this is Tim. Um, what I wanted to do was, before I dive straight into my crazy minority report automated threat modeling world, I wanted to bring you on the journey of threat modeling. Threat modeling is something that we all do. Uh, Tim is a software engineer. He doesn't really know a whole lot about threat modeling. He knows a whole lot about beer because we're British and that's just what we do. Um, but Tim wanted to propose to me when we were going on holiday to South Africa and uh, he had the ring on him as we were going through uh, Heathrow Airport security. And as he got to Heathrow Airport security, he realized he was going to have to get the ring out of his pocket. Why he decided to travel with the ring in his pocket when he didn't want to propose for a few days is beyond me, but he was very excited. And he realized he was with me. Oh, God, I'm going to have to propose to her right now. What do I do? And he started to think about, like, this is what I want to do, and these are all the things that are going to go wrong. And he got, like, a little bit stressed. He was sweating. I'm like, Tim, chill out. We're in Africa. We're about to head on holiday. This is so exciting. And he's like, oh, my God. And I'm like, what's happening? And then he looks at me, and he says, I'll race you. I'm really competitive. I can't help it. Um, so I look at him, and I'm like, you're on. And I kind of walk, but without running, because I don't want to get caught by anyone in security. And I'm trying to be as inconspicuous as possible whilst trying to get away from him as much as possible so that I can try and get through airport security faster than he did. And I'm like walking along, and I'm like, right, my goal is to get through airport security. I'm like, what can go wrong? OK, well, I don't want anyone in front of me that's got young children. Or I don't want anyone in front of me that's got prams or has got a belt and big boots. I'm like, how do I get across? Well, how can I mitigate these things? So I get across first, obviously. Uh, and he kind of gets through a little later, and all of a sudden, he's way more relaxed. And he, um, he does propose a few days later on top of Table Mountain. There was a bit of drama because Table Mountain was closed for winds, and I've never seen a man freak out so much about a mountain being closed because of winds. Um, but he managed to do it. And uh, the reason I love the story, apart from you know, seeing a guy really freak out, um, is that he, he threat modeled that scenario. He thought about what can go wrong, what can I do about it? And at the end, he was like, oh, I did a good job. I got through, and she didn't know I was going to propose. And for me, when I walked around, I'm like also thinking, OK, what do I need to do? I need to get through airport security faster than him. Well, what can go wrong? Well, someone could stop me. And it made me realize that we threat model in our daily interactions all the time. We just don't realize we do it. And what I want to do today is tell you, hey, there are a whole load of frameworks that we can use to do it. And when you think about it in this way, it demystifies it a lot of the time. So, Threat modeling no longer has to be an activity that's led by a security person. It can be a software engineer. It can be a product owner. It can be a project manager or a scrum master. It doesn't have to be us. So I just wanted to make it feel a bit more human. But before I go on, I just want to cover off that there are a whole load of frameworks and methodologies. I'm not going to go into all of these, and you would have heard about some today. Um, in their previous talk in, um, in Hall B, just before this, Autodesk just announced another threat modeling mod methodology that they're releasing under Creative Commons. So if you missed that talk, I would highly recommend having a look at the recording for it. Um, so there's a whole load of methodologies out there, but most of them follow this simple process, which is, what am I doing? What can go wrong? Uh, what can I do about it? And did I do a good job? And I really just want to focus on those bits. Those are the bits that are natural for us. So I'm going to bring you on a journey. Threat modeling can be very confusing. You get all these crazy diagrams, and on top of that, you have tables and spreadsheets. And personally, for me, spreadsheets is where data goes to die. I know very few people that put a lot of data in spreadsheets and genuinely call it back naturally all of the time. So to put our threat models in spreadsheets just feels really like it makes me itchy. Um, and so this, for me, is what puts people off threat modeling, right? You have to sit down. You do this laborious exercise. No one knows if they get their diagrams right, because they're never the same. They're very confusing. And realistically, who does data flow diagrams naturally, unless you're a data architect or you're working on the OAuth project? There's no other data flow diagram. So for me, it's hard. I came from an architecture background. I love a good diagram. But when you have people that get itchy on whether you've got a square or a diamond in your diagram, you know that you're focusing on the wrong thing. So I started to think about. I have this conversation I had with a manager about six years ago, and he talked about this kind of, hey, you could pull in an asset, and you could automatically generate some threats. I kind of thought about it a bit more and was like, maybe he's not talking about purple blockchain with more RAM. Maybe this is actually a thing that could happen. And I started to think, well, rather than having a minority report, what if we could create the threat modeling majority report? And I got really excited. 
So I thought, okay, there's this idea that as an engineer, when I first think about a thing that I want to build, I'm going to start declaring assets, and then I should really be able to be thinking, okay, well, here are common threats that are applicable to you as you, as you start to think of your design, and maybe I can use that to influence our engineer's design. The other idea, and it's a, a slightly lazy one, was, again, I don't scale, so I can't come to every product conversation. I can't come to every research piece. So if I could create a tool that gives them, hey, here's some initial things to think about if you want to build a serverless uh, application or if you want to work with Postgres uh, databases. It makes my life a whole lot easier. So I started to think about building this. So attempt number one was a how to hack three US banks database that I accidentally built, which is effectively a um, terribly put together Postgres database with a whole list of threats that weren't properly sanitized and then a whole load of fixes. It was good in practice, but my development skills, so I built effectively a Flask web app on top of it, weren't great, <laughs> they were really bad. Um, but what happened was we started to get closer to this idea that as an engineer, I could put in, hey, I want to work with Postgres, and it would come back with a load of threats. I didn't properly sanitize it, so what I actually did was say, hey, here are all the ways to hack everything else that your company's building at the moment that uses Postgres databases. But it got us one step closer. The other problem was every time teams were doing a threat model, I was putting that data in there, and that was great, but it was still really laborious to keep putting that data in and think about sanitization. So I took a step back. Um, I joined Firebox Group um, last year, at the end of last year, um, and I work for a guy called Dennis Cruz, I mentioned earlier, who um, founded the OWASP London chapter and a whole load of OWASP projects. Um, Dennis um, loves pictures and graphs, and for any of you that have seen him speak, he speaks about 10 times faster than I do, which is really saying something. But he's incredibly passionate, and he works incredibly hard. And when I joined Firebox, they used Jira. They used Jira as a graph database, which I thought was really strange. And it started with a workflow. So rather than having to do doing dump, which they do have, they do use Jira as a workflow management tool. They also use it for risks. And in this case, they created a workflow just for managing risks through the life cycle. So you have a Jira ticket for a risk, and you can track it all the way through to being risk being assessed, to accepted, to validated, and fixed, or false positive. I'm like, that's pretty cool. I kind of like that. They started to use Jira a whole lot more. So they were, when they, you look at a ticket, they started to use these uh, other attributes and assets to it. And we use labels a whole lot. We've actually started using links insanely. And it's a way to link a threat to an asset, an IT asset. And in my head, I'm like, I know what this is. Like, I don't have to build a Postgres database and become a terrible DBA anymore. I don't even have to build my own UI because Jira does it for me. So I'm like, maybe I can use this to start to create my crazy majority report style threat model. So I have a think about it, and I work with Dennis, and we come up with a Slack bot. And this has um, recently been open sourced, and I'll share some info on this at the end. But what we did is we took all that Jira data on um, every threat. So every time we did a threat model, every time we did pen testing or any type of SAS testing, we took each finding that was validated and we created a Jira ticket for it. And what's great now is a lot of these companies actually have Jira APIs, so we started to automate a lot of that for ourselves too. Pump all that data into an ALK stack, and now we query it with a Python-based um, uh, Slack GS bot, or a Slack bot, that can give us information on the threats we find. So I'm like, great. I'm going to make myself some automated, cool threat modeling diagrams. So I try it. This is one. This isn't great. Um, there's a, a theory called Miller's theorem, which some of you may have heard of, which says a diagram should really only have five plus or two minus boxes. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit later how often I break that theory. Um, but it was interesting. So I have an IT asset here. I have a whole load of threat model findings. And then I've started to link back to the fixes, and then in some cases, the story on Teams backlogs. Now, it's not really incredibly useful in this, in this method, but what I started to see was, at a super high level, the number of threats I was finding and the number of them that actually had fixes. And at a really high level, and we'll cover this later, the number of fixes that could actually solve more than one threat, which was really interesting. So I took it a bit further, and I thought, OK, if I take a step back from this, for this to really work, for me to create a predictive threat modeling world, I need a taxonomy. So if there's anyone here from Synopsys in the room, you might recognize this. This is yours. Great job. Um, and this is a great taxonomy, and I started to use this to think about how do I bring in threats, but then how do I also consider things like bugs and flaws and services. So I simplified it a little bit. Um, this is on my uh, Twitter as well. I'm very lucky to work for someone who loves to open source and creative commons, pretty much everything we do. 
Um, and I stuck it back and I, I simplified it because we're on a journey, we're on an agile journey and we're iterating and we're moving and we're trialing stuff all the time. And I thought, okay, well, I don't just want to bring out and talk about threats and vulnerabilities. And I'm using that word interchangeably, so you have to forgive me as part of this talk. Um, but I wanted to talk about fixes. So how do I reuse fixes in what I'm doing as well? So that if I tell a team, hey, you've got this threat and you need to fix it, I can also link to Git links. So I provide Git links for internal repos where we fixed it um, so that we can hopefully speed that up for our teams too. So I tried it and I thought, okay, I'm actually going to properly build my new majority report tool. And I thought, this is what happened. Um, so I was like, I'm going to do it. I'm going to create a diagram. And I ran my first command, and this is what I got back. And um, this uh, gave Dennis a bit of a headache, so I poor CISO. Um, and I think our risk manager kind of threw up a little bit. And I was like, it's fine. I'll try it again. And then I tried it one more time, because I thought, you know what? I'll just use a different JavaScript library for my diagram, and that'll fix it. Um, and it made me realize that I was pulling in too much data. So what happened was I tried to be really sneaky, and I was like, you know what? I'm going to bring in CWEs, I'm going to bring in or CVs, I'm going to bring in um, SAS and DAS um, threats. And I brought in a whole lot of stuff, and what I effectively created was like a, a false positive threat vomit map of like anything that could possibly be wrong. So I took a step back and thought, okay. What I really need to do here is think about what's relevant. And the beauty of having worked in a couple of companies and done threat modeling, gosh, for the last maybe five or six years is that I've started to work out what's likely. Um, I've looked at threat actors and I've looked at my landscape and I've started to think, okay, what do I need to consider in this story? So I took it a step back and I created a much better looking map where, and this is, a, this is very overly simplified and isn't all of the threats. Um, but I started to think about, okay, with a Postgres database, how do, why don't I just pull in the things that I know are, are fit my threat vector for the application or the service and the industry that I'm working in? So I'm still working at how I do this. And some of it comes down to ultimately how bad the CV is, because sometimes, um, even though the CV might not be super likely, if it's like a 9.8, like I still need to consider that patch, uh, like the RDP one recently, or the um, Kubernetes one a little while ago. Um, but I also wanted to make sure that I'm saying to our engineers, hey, if I'm going to tell you this threat, it can't be this super obscure, ridiculous, out of nowhere threat. It needs to be something that you should fix. And I started to also capture this fix data where I could say, hey, if you prioritize all these fixes that we tell you, and as security people, we can be really guilty of just throwing a load of fixes at our engineers. And it all joins their backlog together, right? And then they prioritize based on effort. They don't prioritize on how much it fixes or what it fixes unless we give them that information. So I thought about a pivot point with this. And I thought, OK, well, I have all of these vulnerabilities for my project, and I've got all these fixes. But actually, what I can start to do with this data is I can say, hey, if I've got certain fixes, I can say to our engineering teams, you know what? I know I've given you like 100 things to do, but I'm going to show you some data, and I'm going to quantify why you should go over certain fixes first. And then we're going to look at the likelihood and the impact of the threats that we're finding so we can properly prioritize. The idea being, none of us are 100% secure. I know, I'm sorry. I'm going to call you out on it. Um, but actually, we know that our engineers also can't fix everything. So how do we properly prioritize and get the most for their time um, and really prove and demonstrate the impact that they're having each time they fix? It's also great for your engineers from a, a performance and a personal development perspective because they really can see the impact they're having each time they invest in that time. I also did it with heat maps. So what I did. Um, and the code for this has also been open source recently. So we said, okay, well, if we're creating these huge threats, that's not really, those are kind of mind threat vomit maps aren't really readable. So we started to put them in categories and create heat maps. And what we could do is we could say, hey, if you do these stories and you fix these things, you'll go from A to B. Uh, more recently, I used it to say, hey, for my new department, if you give me like an extra 200,000 pounds, we'll go from here to here for my budget, or half a million will go from here to here. But actually, it was a really good way to quantify, because this can look a little bit demystified, but when I took it a step back and showed them the other really scary maps underneath it, I could actually drive it all the way down to an individual threat and vulnerability and show the progress they were making over time. So the other thing I started to look at was attack trees. I'm going to cover this super quickly because we're low on time. But attack trees I found really confusing. And I really struggle to get my head around them. And there's been some great talks this week on how to actually use them. But what we started to do was when we thought about our threat model and all that data is we started to work in reverse for the attack tree. 
So rather than work from the beginning of how I want to open the safe, we started from, we've had an incident, someone's opened the safe, whilst we wait for our SEAM teams to come up with uh, what's happened and to give us the right direction to go after, and they run through their playbooks. We started to work in reverse, okay, what are all the ways that could have caused that incident that I know of? And then we've used that to add to our threat models. In smaller companies and startups, we've also been looking at using this to actually build the playbooks themselves, especially where the playbooks didn't exist in the first place. It's made it um, a really interesting exercise, and there's a couple of times where I've done this and I've, be I've beaten the team team in uh, finding the compromise point, which has been really interesting. So it's still, a, it's still a journey for the attack vectors, and I've modified the four questions when I do a reverse attack tree, and I uh, apologize to Adam Shostak if he ever watches this for doing that. Um, but it's been a really interesting journey for us to kind of use that to, to change the way we use them. So finally, elevation of privilege. Um, this is the last one I'm going to tell you about. So this has been around for a really long time, was released by Microsoft, was to help with your threat models. Um, what I want to do today is I want to tell you about an open source project that I've been working on um, that I'm going to be releasing in the next couple of weeks. And these are called Cloudy Cards. So I've been doing these for AWS and Azure. And they are based on elevation of privilege, which is a super tool and very helpful, but is somewhat, in the nicest possible way, a little bit dated. Um, so I've been using sources from various threat models that I've seen publicly, as well as many of the public disclosures um, on breaches that we've seen, as well as some data kindly gifted from BugCrowd and HackerOne to create some Cloudy Cards. I'm going to be looking for contributors to these for this project, so if you're interested in building out our Cloudy Cards, you're more than welcome. But the idea behind these is to work with engineering teams and delivery teams and say, hey, as you're building your AWS infrastructure and you're thinking about doing threat models, if you want to use these, here are some additional prompts to help you think about threat vectors in your environment. So, I talked about a whole load of different things. There's some favorites listed here. Um, and effectively, they are um, a whole lot of open source tools that I've been using recently. We've got everything from Security Monkey. Um, I'm going to apologize after for this one, but I know you're from Netflix, but I don't know if anyone's ever tried to configure Security Monkey. Yeah, it's really hard. Um, you get there, but there's some dependency pinning that they don't do that they, they need to fix on that one. But it's actually a really great tool for visualization, and it's free, which is really important. So these are some of the tools that are available now. If you um, search for Dennis Cruz or Photobox Group Security on GitHub, you'll be able to find all of our open source tools, which include that Slack bot, the risk maps, and all the graphing engines that we've been working on at the moment. We're really passionate about using data science so that we can be data driven in the security approaches that we use. Um, so we'd love you guys to get involved and have a look at that stuff that we're doing. Um, and I'm on Twitter, I'm at Tash J Norris, and I'll be announcing some Git links to our Cloudy Card decks super soon. And that's it, thank you.